It's Thursday, the 24th of May 2018, and this is your EV News Daily. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you're listening around the world, a very warm welcome from London here in the UK. Here is today's news about electric cars and the future of transport. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every EV article online, so you don't have to. Coming up on today's show, a 390 horsepower plug-in hybrid from BMW, and watch an hour-long video of a Tesla Model 3 battery being disassemble it's only for the most hardcore but first of all we'll start with another supercar on the way not soon though no doubt that right now at the top of the ev tree is the forthcoming roadster and the forthcoming rimac c underscore two but audi has a plan to change all of that well audi's global boss of product and technology communications peter Obendorfer confirmed to motoring.com.au that a rival to the monstrously powerful 800 kilowatt Rimac is being discussed at Audi. He says this, and I quote, We consider everything at the moment, but I personally believe we need a little bit more battery development for an EV supercar. Uh, he singled out solid-state batteries as a possible solution. I quote, Because if you go very fast, you need a lot of battery and don't want to spend three days going from the Nürburgring to Munich or the other way around, end quote. Well, he was highlighting the fact that the 550 kilometer trip between the two would require frequent recharging with the current level of lithium-ion battery technology. And I agree with him, but I don't see how solid-state battery technology would necessarily change that. Unless, of course, he's talking about some very advanced solid-state batteries that have much longer range. But with that comes discharge rates and the fact that they're not even being commercialised yet. So we're talking a long way off. The e-tron Quattro is the first of the Audi EVs coming soon. The first of four, actually, which are definitely on the roadmap. Now, he continued, I think lithium iron will develop further efficiency gains, but not very significantly. Our development boss, Peter Mertens, is speaking of solid state batteries, which are still a few years away. But I think it would be an advantage if it will be developed. So the batteries get lighter and need less space, end quotes. Well, moving from Audi to BMW and Gabriel Nice, a BMW blog has been talking about the new BMW X5 and getting quite excited, saying that with everyone focusing on SUVs these days, and since hybrid models are in really big demand, BMW are going to do something about the iPerformance model of the new X5. Well, that's uh, coming very, very soon, by the way. The BMW X5 xDrive 40e will be replaced next year. Uh, the likely combo is going to be a 2-litre gas engine. That's going to produce about 250 brake horse and then coupled with a really powerful electric motor. Proper plug-in hybrid, proper distance as well that you can do on battery power alone. Uh, what will change though, he says, uh, the electric motor and the batteries. BMW will be using next-gen batteries in all of their future EVs and plug-ins not quite sure what next gen means but they are talking about a longer range a chip into an overall uh, lower weight for the x5 and a real life this is a real life pure ev range of the bmw x5 of 30 miles that is a lot of your commuting uh, if you have a big suv a lot of car you must admit the bmw x5 more than most people need but if you are going to have one right it's better that you spend monday to friday doing it on all electric and then if you really must use a combustion engine at the weekends, then do that. You'll be converted to electricity pretty quickly so that your next car is full, Bev. Uh, well, if all that turns out exactly as we expect it to, uh, it remains to be seen, but the new BMW X5 is going to be a very popular choice. Totally agree, because, of course, a 30-mile real-world range on the battery means that they'll be getting some very low emissions figures, and that's going to be the key for making sure those big SUVs uh, end up on the market. Well, you wait years for a car that you put your deposit down on, you finally get it from the factory, and then you wreck it. That's not the fairy tale story of any Model 3 reservation holder or even the 30 odd thousand Model 3 owners somewhere in the world right now. Uh, but as Inside EVs picked up on a story from EVTV, they have a Model 3, they have a battery pack, they have a drivetrain from a salvage auction and they've taken it apart. Well, Dominic at Inside EV says that before the uh, pack was divorced from the car's chassis, we learned one of the things that separates it from the energy found beneath the Model S, not designed 
with battery swapping as a possibility. Uh, I'll just r remind you, in case you'd forgotten, uh, that in the early days of the Model S, by the way, Elon was talking up battery swapping, and of course it... They tried to make it a thing for a while, uh, the idea of popping into your Tesla showroom when you've got no battery, and that's all right, we'll just swap your battery out, and bang, new one, off you go. Yeah, that never quite worked out. Uh, well, the differences don't stop there either. Unlike the Model S and pretty much every other EV on the market, uh, the Model 3 has the AC charger and the uh, DC to DC converter all inside the battery pack. So by the sounds of it, the battery packs that are coming from Nevada are one unit. So normally it'd be the batteries and then all the other ancillary stuff that the um, uh, would be assembled. But by the sounds of it, the pack is everything, which I hadn't heard before about the Model 3. Uh, typically, uh, those components are the ones found under the hood, and the advantages and disadvantages of that are things like you speed up the assembly process, but on the other hand, if one of the components goes bad, uh, says the article, uh, the time and cost to fix it is going to be elevated. Well, check out the link to Inside EVs in the show notes. On the podcast show notes, you can watch the full video that's over an hour long. Or Jehu Garcia has a nine-minute summary. Now, I have a two-hour car jo uh, train journey uh, tomorrow morning to work, so I'll definitely be watching over an hour of a car being disassembled. And I can't wait for whatever commuter sits down next to me and glances across at my phone and thinks to themselves, is that guy watching a car battery being taken apart? for an hour. Yep, that'll be me. Uh, well, one of my favourite bloggers is Pedro at Push EVs. He doesn't blog too often, uh, but when he does, it's always something brilliant, really interesting. And now he's taking apart a post on charging speeds by Fastned. Now, Fastned plugged in a range of EVs and measured the charge speeds under ideal conditions. I give you that. Uh, and not repeated charges either, as far as I know. Uh, they took the Leaf uh, the 24, the 30, and the 40. And it's interesting to look at the graphs which Fastned produces. You can see that the 30 kilowatt hour, sort of the Gen 2, not really called that leaf, uh, 30 kilowatt hour leaf hangs on to really fast 50 kilowatt charge speeds all the way up to 80% state of charge, and then it just drops off. Whereas you can see the charge levels, the graph on the new leaf, the 40 kilowatt hour new leaf, um, it falls off a cliff at 60 but then it just kind of tapers more down to 20 to 30 kilowatt speeds and just protects the battery there. It's really interesting differences. They do the same for the BMW i3, the 22 and the 33 kilowatt hour versions. The original gen car of the BMW i3 is much more conservative with the charge speed. Um, far lower down, the newer version, ha they've had some improvements, almost the opposite of the Leaf. Uh, the Hyundai Ioniq, by the way, well, Fastned plugged that into the new 175 kilowatt chargers. Now, that blitzed it until 80% state of charge, and then it dropped off. Uh, the original e-Golf, that would take a higher speed, really high speed, up to about 75% battery state of charge, but then started to throttle it and protect the battery. Whereas the new Golf, which has got that 36 kilowatt hour pack, it does charge all the way up to 80% slower than the first gen e-Golf. So that charge speed is just a few kilowatts slower, but it keeps on going all the way up to 80% SOC. And then the drop is far more gentle. Now look, I'll put a link into the show notes of all these graphs and I'll put them on Twitter as well. So if you're listening to this, check us out at EV News Daily on Twitter. Uh, really fascinating just to sit and and, uh, and look at these. Uh, must be said, done under ideal conditions as far as I understand and not repeated charges. Well, Toyota have been electrifying cars longer than most with the Prius, but they are setting out their stall in the form of soft hybrids. And even, you know, even a proper hybrid, really. Car Scoops says that speaking with Ward's Auto, uh, Toyota's executive GM of Powertrain said this, and I quote, We believe that hybrids will come ahead of full electrics. Well, the company recognises that other companies are going to go straight to EVs. Uh, Shizuo Abe went on to say, We believe our biggest weapon for meeting fuel efficiency and CO2 regulations, not just Europe but globally, will continue to be hybrids. And well, they would know they've been making hybrids for a very long time, and you see the Prius everywhere now. The new one is that fourth or fifth iteration of the of the Prius. I haven't looked that up. I think it might be on number five. It's a really well-made car. Our company used them uh, for all of our kind of private hire taxis in London, and they're a really nice place to be in the back of the new Prius. It is just a hybrid, and they're definitely saying that that's the way 
they are going to go. Not full EV. Now, Arbe went on to say that the biggest problem with full EVs is the lithium-ion batteries because he says they're so expensive, they're large, they're heavy. He also noted their deterioration characteristics, uh, which is a reference to how the batteries lose capacity as they age and complete hundreds of charging cycles. Well, yes, that is true with some, but then again, you look at the research we've seen from Tesla and the studies that were done in Europe with the kind of crowdsourcing of data, and there's Model S's out there that have done 200,000 miles and are showing very little deterioration. Of course, they have active thermal management, and you look at things like the Tesloop cars in, uh, in California, uh, they're doing some mega, mega miles, and, and the batteries are holding up really well. So, obviously, he knows what he's talking about, but if you're talking about cheap batteries with you know, less thermal management or none, and you're really going to rinse them for taxis and cabs, well, of course, they probably are going to wear out sooner than a Tesla. Well, Tata Technologies MD and the CEO, Warren Harris, has been speaking about how the company's expertise helps OEMs use technology for hybrids and EVs. And he says this, electric cars must be designed from the ground up, simply retrofitting existing car bodies with new batteries and components. It won't do. Newer, cheaper, more efficient batteries will have to be manufactured. He says green mobility is not a buzzword. It's becoming more and more the norm these days in a world becoming more green, more connected, less manual. He says the industry's move to make cars more efficient by leveraging technology that can effectively cut down emissions. Mobility is increasingly becoming more sustainable, he says, with regulations providing a solid backbone. Attitudes towards emissions are changing. He says with governments and industries globally working towards solutions to cut down emissions from combustion engines, as a veteran organization, Tata is providing engineering services for complete vehicle development and one of the leading engineering partners to OEMs, to startups in the EV sector as well. Uh, they're bringing their market-leading expertise, he says, to help manufacturers utilize hybrid and EVs, end quote. So that's interesting. So he's saying that traditional OEMs, I'm not thinking VW, um, not thinking BMW, but there are others who no doubt are behind the curve and are looking at who's got some knowledge, some skills, some smarts. They can just buy in immediately. And Tata, look like they could be one of those companies that large or small companies do bring in uh, to help them get a leg up as more people realizing, hey, this EV thing, it's probably going to happen. Well, I would love to spread the word about electric cars. If you can share this with somebody who might be interested, go on. Uh, you can listen to every previous episode of the podcast. We're talking iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, SoundCloud, SoundCloud uh, iHeartRadio podcasts, and the blog at evnewsdaily.com. If you subscribe, you get them first and free and automatically. And on the socials, we are EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.